You ever felt like you just didn't belong? I'm not talking about fitting in because that's relative and we will always have situations where we just don't fit in. It's natural, but honestly, it's not something we should strive for anyways. A great example of this, and excuse the really cheesy reference, is the movie Mean Girls. I know, corny, right? One of my favorite scenes of this movie is kind of towards the beginning where they just break out into this all out animalistic girl fight and they're screeching and clawing and the other students are freaking out and it's just like animalistic, animalistic and it's just her comparing girl world to you know the African safari animal kingdom world and how conflict is handled. And that's just a funny moment but in all seriousness this is a movie about fitting in and finding your place and how things can go wrong when you try to kind of change yourself to fit in. Unfortunately, it takes Katie, the main character, way too long to figure this stuff out and things spiral out of control. She makes a lot of mistakes all in the name of fitting in. Seeing things like on Wednesdays we wear pink and really tragic things like turning your teacher in, not turning her in, lying about her in a book saying that she's a drug dealer or turning on your friends just to preserve or improve the status quo. Like I said, it takes her a while, but in the end she discovers that truly fitting in means belonging to people who fully know you and fully accept you. Brenny Brown, an expert on courage, vulnerability, shame, and empathy says, one of the biggest surprises in this research was learning that fitting in and belonging are not the same thing. In fact, fitting in is one of the greatest barriers to belonging. Fitting in is about assessing a situation and becoming who you need to be in order to be fully, in order to be accepted. Belonging, on the other hand, doesn't require us to change who we are. It requires us to be who we are. I have always been an individual who felt like I was just on the outside. Someone who everyone knew, someone who everyone liked, just not someone who was invited to the thing. This has been something I've struggled with for years. Always wanting to be in the in crowd or even just in the crowd. And yet just not really considered or just not close enough to be invited. I'm sure you felt this too. And I'm sure you know social media definitely doesn't help. In the matter of an instant, you can scroll through your feed and see all the barbecues, parties, game nights, girls nights, and events that took place without you. But it's in these moments that I have to remind myself that while I don't have all that, I do have all I need. I do have a girl gang. <laughs> And it looks just a little bit different right now, but that's okay. I do have an amazing husband and two amazing little boys that I'm just obsessed with. And I do have a best friend who's basically my ride or die. And most of all, I have a God who calls me his and a savior who died for me. And even if I have none of that, literally nothing else, but still belong to him, I have everything I need. Maybe you felt this way too. Maybe in high school you desperately wanted to be part of the cool kids or the drama team or you wanted to fit in with the football players. Maybe as a new college kid all your friends are going off to fancy expensive colleges and you're staying home saving money by living with your parents and pursuing an online ministry degree and an internship through SEU. Maybe as a young adult, you're looking around at all your friends getting married and starting families and throwing play dates and little kid birthday parties and you don't even have a prospective spouse yet. Or maybe you're kind of on the tail end of life, a little further on, Maybe you're a mom who just doesn't really have time and you look at everybody else and you're like, they have all the time, where is my time? Or maybe you are um, oh, I just, an empty nester, sorry. 
Maybe you're an empty nester and you feel God's call to go back to ministry and to further your education, but all your other friends are starting their retirement and they're traveling and they're getting into all these new hobbies and you just don't feel like you fit in with them anymore. But at the same time, maybe you do have that one person. Maybe you do have a husband or wife that's been by your side through everything and you know they will be there for the rest of your life. Or maybe you have a best friend who's been around since early childhood who is just your person. Or maybe you have a mom or dad who's just become your best friend and your first phone call every, every time, whatever happens, no matter what. Um, and of course, as Christians, we have God and through God, we have community with his church. God brings us into this community by us being with him, we become with each other. God created us with this innate ability to belong, to be fully known and fully accepted. And yet so often we try to fill that void with things that are outside of God and outside of the church. So what does the word say about this? I wanna look at two verses that unpack this thought. First, continuing off last week's reading, we're going to look at Ephesians 2, 11 through 13, which says, Therefore, remember that you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from God, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And second, Galatians 3 verse 28 says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Both of these verses articulate that we are brought together and we are one in Christ. In these passages, Paul is reminding his audience that, that differences don't matter in the body of Christ. He is talking, taking bigger things that divided them in the 21st century, things like religion, status, and gender, and saying, doesn't matter. All are one in Christ Jesus. In Ephesians, he's pleading with them to remember where they came from and to remember the work that Christ has done in their lives. And in Galatians, he brings it home with the reminder that we are all one in Christ Jesus. When we remember who we were before Christ and we remember all he has done for us, we are able to remember that we have more in common with others than we think and we are able to be one church. We all have people we are far from, both geographically and socially. We all have people who are different from us. We will always have people we disagree with. And it's really easy to get caught up in the things that divide us. It may not be a conscious division, but more, just, more of a just, these are my people, and therefore these are not my people mindset. But unfortunately, it's easy for those things to become the most important things. Things like being a Republican or a Democrat, or a mom from the Pacific Northwest versus a mom living in Florida, or a specific race or culture that your family is part of, or even a conservative Christian taking up issues with a liberal progressive Christian but when we let these things become more important to us than Jesus and the cross, then they take over what we hold truest in this world and our identity. Paul is reminding us in these passages that we cannot let our differences define us or divide us. When we remember who we were before Christ and when we remember all he has done for us, when we are able to remember, we we are able to remember we have more in common with others than we think and we are able to be one church while these verses are about unity among believers i also want to make the point 
that they hint at how we should be treating non-believers. Paul is reminding the church what it used to be like to be far from God and alienated from God's people. And he is encouraging Christian believers that now that they aren't those things, to remember what it was like. So instead of spreading more division and more hate, they can be unifiers and peace bringers to a society so divided. When we remember who we were before Christ, and when we remember all God has done for us, We remember that we have more in common with things, others, than we think, and we can be one church. And hopefully, by taking this stance with non-believers, they will grow to understand the love of Christ, and they will get to experience the oneness we have in Christian community. By pursuing someone who would be considered an other to us, both in and out of the church, we are directly reflecting and acting out God's love for the world. Christ came as the ultimate other's pursuer. He was God and he was perfect. And because of our imperfect nature and because of our sinful choices, we were far from him. But he died to take the punishment for our sins so we could be saved and brought near to him as well as each other. So by taking steps towards the other, we are being God's literal hands and feet in a divided world. We are building bridges within the church and creating on-ramps for those far from God and outside of the church. So how do we do this? First, we have to remember that who we were before Christ and all he has done for us. And then we will remember we have more in common with those others than we think. And we are able to show, to take steps, and we are able to take steps towards being one unified church. So that may be your first step, just to remember. Before you take any steps towards someone different than you, just remember. Remember what God has done for you. Remember who you were before him and remember who you are now and how far you've come. You may need God's help to see someone very different beliefs than you as someone you have a lot in common with and through Christ you are still one with. If you've already made it through that point, then there are quite a few possibilities for how this can look. Maybe for you, it's getting together with a friend who has very different political views from you, especially right now, and sitting down with them and saying, look, I'm your friend and I love you, and I know you feel the same about me, but I just wanna listen and I wanna learn, so let's talk. Or maybe it's getting together with someone of a different race from you within your community and listening and learning about how their race impacts how they experience the community that you share. And using these conversations to discuss Jesus's example in building these gaps within your culture to make your community a better place to live for everyone. Or maybe it's making a standing coffee date with a friend from work who's an atheist and just listening and learning from their experiences and looking up for places that God has already impacted their life and just pointing that out to them. Maybe it means looks like a Feed the Hungry event that your church puts on, but invites and partners with all churches and leaders from around your city for that one common goal. Now, before you go thinking, you have no biases or judgments and you just get along perfectly with everyone, uh, I would really encourage you to take a closer look and pray about it. When I started thinking about this topic, I honestly thought I was in a good place. But as I started getting into it, God revealed to me that I have some growing to do in terms of how I view prosperity gospel and liberal or progressive Christians. Ouch. So my next step is getting together with a friend who I think is a lot more liberal in her beliefs than I am and just 
talking it out and listening and learning and trying to grow and still having that common ground of Jesus. And on the flip side of it, I don't know any progressive Christians uh, personally, so I think my step is just to do a little bit of research and try to find objective sources and opinions. Um, so that's me. And it might have turned on a light bulb for you, but there might have been something else earlier that also did that. Uh, but I'm sure if you just pray and ask God what that thing is, he would be more than happy to reveal it to you and to have that conversation with you. Like I pointed out before, this can look like a lot of different things. But the most important thing is laying down our personal biases and preferences and listening well and loving others how Jesus did. It's natural to look for things we have in common with people and to feel a natural affinity towards them. But for us to truly be the church, we have to stop treating our differences and our divisions as deal breakers in who we approve of or are close to or who we think should get into heaven or not. Instead, we have to start looking at the things we have in common. Things like salvation, grace, faith, and Christ as more important and as the foundation for joining together with God in his mission to love and reach all of humanity. If outsiders look at those in the church and all they see is division and strife, why would they ever want in? It's like a big family that gets together on the holidays and all they do is fight. But deep down, they know that they love each other. They just never actually show it. Uh, someone on the outside looking in or someone just visiting may think, wow, they are so dysfunctional, crazy, and sometimes kind of mean. I would never let my worst enemy treat me that way. This is not a family I want to be a part of. Or someone within the family may decide it's not worth their time to keep showing up because they feel so devalued and like they don't really belong anymore. It might be a hard pill to swallow, but this is how some people think of and experience the church. We have to do better. There is too much at stake for this to be something we get wrong. It's hard for me to imagine the possibilities of a unified church because honestly, I don't think I ever thought it could be possible. I'm talking unified across all fronts. Unified across national boundaries, unified across traditional boundaries, unified across political and racial boundaries, unified across socioeconomic boundaries, unified across denominations within our church and around the world. I truly believe, though, that a global unified church would be unstoppable. I think this church could absolutely do things like end world hunger, ensure that all humans have clean drinking water, end racial prejudice and injustice around the world, or quite literally reach the world for Jesus. But I also think the effects of this would be much more so felt on a personal level. One more unlikely friendship at a time. One more person feeling a sense of belonging with someone they never expected. One more person not walking away from the church and instead continuing their ministry because they feel connected to something bigger than themselves. And as one person builds a bridge and so on and so on, then pretty quickly this web of bridges can connect and unite the world with one mission. When we belong to God, we also belong to each other. And it's time we started truly acting like it. Thank you.